Thanks for checking out this episode of Kentucky Running, brought to you by John's Run Walk Shop in Lexington. I'm your host, Matt Reno. If you're listening to a show with running in the title, I'm going to assume you like to run, or at least you're a generally active person. Maybe you like walking, hiking, biking, whatever. But I'm also guessing you do your fair share of driving. It's hard not to. Even if you're going for a run, sometimes you got to drive to get there, as crazy as that sounds. Well, imagine you weren't able to drive. How would you get around? How long would it take? Could you get to work in a way that feels safe? Or would you have to cross busy streets? These are some of the questions the folks behind the Week Without Driving Challenge want you asking yourself. They want us to understand the challenges that non-drivers face every day and find ways to address those challenges in our communities. Today, we're gonna talk to Ford McElroy, who's helping organize Lexington's Week Without Driving Challenge. We'll get to that conversation in just a few minutes. First, we're going to hear from our Saucony rep, Casey, about some of the shoes on the John's Run Walk Shop shelves, including an old favorite that's backed by popular demand. You're listening to Kentucky Run. All right, today we're talking to our Saucony sales rep, Casey Abston. Casey, good to have you on the show, and I want to start by asking, just in general, what's been going on with Saucony in 2024 compared to where you were at in 23? I feel like it's been a really big year. What are some of the big changes you've made over the past year? Yeah, 2023 became a really competitive year, so we really had to buckle down and innovate. And one of the pieces that we needed to do is we had a lot of shoes with a lot of little differences. And that can be a little confusing to people coming in going, hey, this is my first time coming in, or I've been in this shoe forever. What's the difference between this one? You're like, oh, it's a subtle little difference here. We wanted to streamline the process. So there are a few key shoes that we had, Endorphin Shift, which was awesome, but it was really close and could overlap some different shoes like an Echelon or even a Guide. And what we wanted to do is simplify our line. So we dropped the Endorphin Shift. But what we did was take the influence of that. We were doing some external heel counters, providing support with a nice wide base. We brought that over to the guide. We're also listening to consumers. They're looking for a really fun, soft experience underfoot. And some of the technologies that we had used were getting a little legacy, a little old. They had a firmer arch support, which was not what customers were looking for. So you take a shoe like the guide, we brought over that influence from an endorphin shift. We can support the foot in the back by doing uh, higher sidewalls. Our technology, we call it center lining. We can keep the foot centered from heel to toe and provide a nice cushion support story without doing a medial post. If somebody doesn't want a medial post, they're not gonna feel it in this guide. If you need a little bit of support, but you like the cushion feel, you're gonna get that experience. And then we wanted to elevate those stories. So we were looking at midsole foams. What could we do different? Uh, we didn't wanna just make things with more air, make it softer. So we were looking across our portfolio, categories we do really, really well with, like our endorphin race product that product tends to be lighter, softer, a little bit more resilient. So, hey, how can we bring those materials over into our core shoes? And we then introduced a shoe like the Hurricane, taking the support story from the guide and then bringing in awesome midsole materials that are soft, resilient, can last in any sort of environment, bringing that over to a Hurricane. So we're gonna elevate that center line story with a, a shoe like the Hurricane. So continuing to innovate and bring in new technology has been where we're at in 2024. And I think that's carrying over and Customers are seeing it and staff seeing it. It's been really fun this year. Backing up to the guide, I'm really liking that one. I tend to be a neutral shoe wear, but with the mild stability of the guide, that's really been working out well for me. It seems to be more of a shift overall for a lot of shoe brands where you're seeing a lot more mild stability. Are you seeing that as well? Yeah, I'm gonna point out you have the guide on right now, which is exciting to see. And we, we did this impromptu, so you didn't dress for the occasion. What we wanna see is more versatility out of the shoes. Like we can have a shoe wall that has 20 different shoes and you know this goes for 5% of population, this goes for 5% of population, and we're not doing the community a service when we do that. So if we can simplify the shoes, but at the same time make them open to more people, we'll be more successful, we'll deliver a better experience for the customer. So what you're saying is right on. So with the guide, taking out the medial post, but putting in the center line idea, it can now work for somebody who is in a traditional neutral shoe, but then it goes up to where it's been positioned for several years, which is that guidance category, the stability category, those terms have kind of faded, got a little grayer in the last few years as we've done more research and the industry's done more research and figure out how we can support the shoe. When in doubt on the shoe, the guide will work for a large majority of people now compared to where it was in the past. 
we just brought the hurricane and this is kind of a return for you as well right like because the hurricane went away for a while yeah and what was what was the reaction when the hurricane went away and what was the impetus behind bringing it back I mean, it just goes back to having a crowded marketplace and what's working, what's not. The hurricane kind of lost its way. One of our designers laughed and he called it the kitchen sink era. And it was like, to, to sell a shoe, we had to pack in more and more technologies. And it's like, hey, we got this and we got this and we got this. And we almost got to the point where we were over engineering the shoes so to the point like we put a big crash pad on the outside. Hey, we're going to stick this soft foam way out far to help slow down the rate of pronation. Well, we create a lever effect at that point to where we are increasing pronation. So the shoe got a little complex, a little lost. We dropped it. Bringing the hurricane back, we felt like that was back to sock and back to our innovation. It was a key shoe for us. We wanted to get back to that time where going for a run was just fun and distraction, free moment. It was an escape from life. So the hurricane to us is, is a time that we're really proud of and we want to get back to that spot. So a little different. We, it, there's a new generation now so when you look at the hurricane not exactly like what it was three four years ago when it was out in the marketplace but bringing in that new innovation the new thought process and delivering that high cushion guidance feeling underfoot for the customer so it's a nice complete circle nice sounds like you're taking more of that keep it simple stupid approach great move good to have the hurricane back uh casey anything else you want to say about where Saucony is headed uh, in the rest of the year or or into the future yeah, so we've positioned ourselves. We want to be the king of foams. We're having some fun with that idea. You know, we want it to be lightweight, but we don't want it to feel dead. It needs to have some energy return. And how can we deliver that in a really fun approach? And we have uh, a new midsole foam and Creta run that is really fun. And it gets back to the root of what running is. When I've had my samples out and let people try the shoe on, they just look up at me with this huge smile, like, what's going on under my foot? This is nothing that I've experienced before. And that's what we want to deliver. It's just that chance for anybody, runner, walker, put on a shoe, you step outside and you're like, you know what? It feels good to get outside for exercise today. We're getting back to that innovation and, and that fun cycle. So it's an exciting time to be part of the brand. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Casey. Appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Good time. Ford McElroy, good to have you on the Kentucky Running Podcast to talk about the Week Without Driving Challenge happening September 30th through October 6th. Ford, I'm going to admit, this sounds both wonderful and a little terrifying. Tell us about the challenge and how you got involved. Yeah, thanks for having me, Matt. Its main goal is to raise awareness to people who can't drive or choose not to drive. For There are lots of different reasons that can happen. It's empathy-driven, if you will. Is it meant to make people... A little nervous, like, oh, I could never go a week without driving. Maybe I should do something about that. Yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly, that's a good way to put it. In a way, it is a challenge to go a week without driving, but more importantly, it's a chance to identify and discuss barriers in our transportation system as a community. If you drive regularly and aren't able to make it a full week without driving, then we invite you to think of it as mindful driving week. If you can't complete a task without driving, consider what someone without access to a car or driver license would do. Okay, cool. So what are some of the barriers that people have in a car-centric society? Safe places to walk or bike, scattered, inconsistent public transit. From an environmental perspective, it's super inefficient to have one, maybe two people in giant two-ton boxes. Obviously, there's safety concerns. Pedestrian fatalities have been increasing for the last few years. 2022 was a 40-year high in pedestrian fatalities. Wow. Yeah, I saw that pedestrian and bicyclist collisions and fatalities have been skyrocketing, yeah. including 20 fatalities in Lexington in 2023. What are the main factors in this trend aside from just more cars on the road? A lack of safe alternatives to ride or walk outside of the main roads. Driving culture is another thing. If drivers aren't trained to look for pedestrians and cyclists, then they're more likely to not even give a second look when they turn left at an intersection, something like that. Thinking back to when I was 16 in Ohio, I don't remember any sort of training during driver's ed about look for cyclists, look for pedestrians, here's a sidewalk, you should be looking, that kind of thing. Another thing, cars have been getting bigger and bigger and heavier and heavier, and there are more and more cars with higher hood heights too, which makes it harder for drivers to see pedestrians and is more likely to be fatal if an impact occurs. At the very least, we should be reminding people to 
just be more aware. Yeah. Eyes on the road. Don't be looking at your phone. Yeah. Yeah. That's basic stuff. But it seems like the bigger picture here is to get drivers imagining what it's like for people who aren't able to drive. Exactly. Yeah. It's again, it's an empathy driven thing. It's not that we're not saying that no one should drive ever. A car is a, a tool that is useful for some times. But when everyone is driving everywhere, we get crazy traffic. It's super unsafe. It's super bad for the environment. Yeah. Now, I feel like there's a little bit of a catch 22 here because I'm someone who would love to bike to work more often, but I don't because it doesn't feel safe. There's not a huge bike culture here. So I'm worried that other people just aren't aware that I'd be out there on a bike. So what can we do to change that? Yeah, that's a great question. So there's always the long term things of, you know, talk to your friends, talk to legislators, talk to your city council members about these issues more immediately. There are some resources. People for Bikes is a nonprofit that has maps of, I think, most North American cities then classifies streets and bike paths by high or low stress. So find a potential route, see if it matches all low stress routes on people for bikes. I know I definitely don't trust Google Maps' initial bike route if I'm looking for a new route. Are any of our local government officials participating? Yes, yeah, we've had a very positive response from city council. I know some of them are, are going to try and participate. Yeah, like I said earlier, it's it's not as much like, a, oh no, if you drove during this week, you lost. It's more, if you did drive, think about why you had to, or if you successfully go the whole week without driving, think about what was it like? What would it be like if I always had to do this? What were the barriers? What was uncomfortable? That's great. You were talking about empathy. Well, now we have government officials seeing what it's like for their constituents who can't drive everywhere. And hopefully that will inform some of their decision making. What are some of the actions they can take, though? It seems like it's kind of hard to retrofit a city that's pretty much been built for cars. Actually, it's pretty exciting. The city government is already doing a lot. This is not the first time that pedestrian safety or bike or public transit things have crossed their minds. They've got this cool long-term plan that has a lot of ideas about this in it. UK just planned an exciting new project called Campus to Commons that will retrofit the Virginia and Red Mile stretches to be more bike friendly. So there are, there are a lot of good ideas in motion, but well, any government is slow. But yeah, they're, they're all, the city government is doing a lot. We appreciate what they're already doing. Fantastic. Yeah, we've got some good people in our local government. For sure. Okay, let's step outside of Lexington and Central Kentucky. Can you think of any success stories from other places where they've shown something like this can be done? Yeah, the organization called Strong Towns actually has a lot of cool success stories about this. Strong Towns does a Town of the Year contest, and actually the winner for 2023 was a town in Vermont, Brattleboro, Vermont. Did I say that right? Brattleboro, yes. Brattleboro. Yeah, I actually lived in Vermont for many years. Yeah, Brattleboro is a cool place. Yeah, they're definitely out there, and there are a lot of people making similar efforts across the country. And in fact, Week Without Driving is a national campaign put on by America Walks. I probably should have mentioned this like at the beginning, but yeah, America Walks puts on this campaign and they set it up so that local entities can adapt it. And that's what we're doing. Obviously, there's a negative environmental impact to having more cars on the road, but I think there are some hidden costs that people don't really think about. Right. Can we talk about some of those? For sure. Uh, like with many societal issues, it affects people unfairly. Driving is incredibly expensive from the cost of the car itself to insurance to maintenance. And that's prohibitive for many people. Another thing is social isolation. I mean, if you're driving alone or with other people, you're you're cut off from everybody else around you. Whereas if you're walking or biking or taking public transit, it's definitely more community focused. You can interface with people in a more human way. I'm sure you've experienced when driving, it just feels like you versus the boxes, the big steel boxes. It cuts you off from people and it makes people more reckless and angry. And it's just, it can be a very unpleasant experience. Yeah, everyone's your enemy because they're keeping you from getting to your important destination on time. Yeah. and. Back to the discrimination, I feel like it's a cruel irony that we place so much emphasis on making sure buildings are ADA compliant, as we should, but we don't put enough emphasis on getting people to those buildings in a safe and accessible way. 
for sure. Yeah, I love biking. I think it's a lot of fun, but that's not a physically viable option for everyone or a comfortable option for everybody. Everybody. So this is where public transit comes in or for trips that are longer than is feasible to bike. Yeah, having a, a good public transit network that is accessible for everyone. Okay, so maybe I'm a little biased on this next point, but it does seem like a driver-oriented community isn't as great for small businesses. Would you agree? Yeah, it's harder to stop if you're in a car. A lot of small businesses are in places that are harder to park your car, which and sounds like a downside, but also usually places that are harder to park are more enjoyable to walk or bike to, side note. Mm-hmm. The nature of car travel makes it harder for people to stop and enjoy local businesses, smaller businesses. I mean, there are a lot of factors that go into the struggles of of small businesses, but certainly car centrism is not helping. Yeah, definitely. Parking is an issue, but also if you have to drive to every place you need to go, you're less inclined to stop in multiple stores. It's like if you can walk from shop to shop for different things, you'll go to multiple stores during the day. But if you have to get in your car, drive somewhere, find parking in between every store, that's going to make you look for a big box store, one stop shopping alternative. For sure. For sure. And then less of that money is staying in the community. This gets into economic and zoning issues that are a little bit beyond the scope of what we're talking about. But zoning, I guess, is, is, is pretty relevant in that if you're zoned for only homes, you have to drive somewhere, especially if the infrastructure is set up that only a car could get through. If no bus comes to your neighborhood and all of the grocery stores are five miles away, you're kind of stuck. And this is the situation that a lot of people find themselves in. And that unfortunately is the type of place that we've built in a lot of places across the country and are now kind of realizing, oh, maybe it would be better to have a little corner store next to the homes or things like that. So for listeners who are interested in participating or supporting the Week Without Driving Challenge, which again is happening September 30th through October 6th, you can learn more at the link in our show notes. What else can people do to participate, not only in this, but also other initiatives working to make a difference? Many organizations across Lexington have agreed to post a lot of the media that will be associated with the Week Without Driving. So keep an eye out for local businesses. Live Green Lex will be posting on Instagram there through the city government. The list is still growing. So check out the link in the show notes and Live Green Lex on Instagram. And what are some other actions listeners can take to help make a safer community for pedestrians and bicyclists? Be mindful of it yourself. Talk to your representatives. Learn more about the perspectives of people who can't or choose not to drive. Strong Towns, which we've already mentioned, is a good resource. Nice. Okay, one more question. Uh, This is kind of a big one, so take your time with it. If this movement for a less driver-centric society takes off and really makes serious progress, how do you envision the future of transportation in America? Oh, man. It would be awesome to not have to own a car to be able to participate in normal society or traditional society. It's fun to take a train out to a national park or something. I love the picture of, you know, someone with a baguette in the front basket of their bike. That's kind of the dream. <laughs> yeah. Be able to walk down a safe and quiet street and enjoy surroundings without the noise of traffic. Uh, and that's not a jab at our public transit. They do a great job with the funding they have, by the way. Right. So it sounds like there are a lot of really great things that could come about. But we just don't think about them because we don't even know they're possible. It's like we see driving as the way it is. And that's the way it has to be. We're not thinking that there could be good alternatives if we have the right infrastructure. Yeah, well said, well said. These big picture ideas take some time to implement, time and money. You know, it's not easy to retrofit, but it's possible. There are countries that have done this. Amsterdam famously became incredibly bike friendly from a car centric 70s. Yeah, it's possible. It takes a lot of people that have the vision and the willingness to to advocate for it. Well, I'm glad people like you are advocating for it. Once again, the Week Without Driving Challenge, September 30th through October 6th. Link in the show notes. Ford, thank you so much for being on Kentucky Running. Thanks for having me, Matt. Week Without Driving. I'm honestly not sure how I would make that work. But I have the luxury of not needing to make it work. Not everyone has that luxury, which is why I'm glad I got to talk to Ford. It got me thinking... And I hope our conversation did the same for you. Even more, I hope it inspires you to take action. Along with the week without driving, Ford sent me some other links for people who want to get involved in helping bring about more accessible roads. Links are in the show notes. 
For John's Run Walk Shop, I'm Matt Reno. I appreciate you tuning into the show. And if you want to help others discover it, please leave a rating and review. It helps a lot. We'll talk again soon on Kentucky Running.